In this video, I'm going over four rules of logic for economic modeling. And this is the base model that I like to start with always when I'm thinking about these things. So um, it's a model of someone choosing how much time to study in a given week. And their objective function is their grades minus their opportunity cost, where both of those are a function of time spent studying. And we have two exogenous variables in there, which are intelligence is exogenous and extracurricular activities that you're committed to is also exogenous. So the first rule is that every term in a model needs to have the choice variable in it. And the reason for this is the whole purpose of a model is to model a particular choice. So if there's a term in the model that has nothing to do with that choice, it just doesn't belong in the model. And so let me give you an example of a violation of this rule. So I've added a term to this model, which is health as a function of how much junk food you eat. And it's not that this term is wrong, like health is a function of how much junk food you eat. It just has nothing to do with time spent studying. So when we solve this model, when we do comparative statics, the optimal choice of time spent studying will not have anything to do with this term. There's no variables that are in this term only that are gonna show up in the solution to this model, so it just doesn't matter. So make sure every term has a choice variable. All right, the second rule of modeling is that the choice variable cannot be a function of anything in your model. And this one is actually pretty counterintuitive, but the reason it's counterintuitive is because there's a difference between your model and the solution to the model. And, and specifically, there's a difference between your choice variable in the model, which can take on any value, and the choice variable that is the solved solution to the model. S star is going to be the optimal choice of your time spent studying, whereas Time spent studying up here, S with no star, is your experimental time spent studying, where you can kind of experiment with an entire graph of this, an entire graph of this, and S can take on any value you want up here. Down here, after you've solved your model, you have a specific value of S. And your S star is going to be a function of every exogenous variable in your model. So it's a function of, your, the optimal time spent studying is a function of your intelligence and your extracurricular commitments. This will pop out of your model, and because of that, people often try to stick something like this into their model, and that violates the logic. So let me show you what a violation of that would look like. So oftentimes when people are building a model, they'll say, well, the time spent studying is a function of intelligence. So they'll stick it into the model like this. And this, of course, violates our rule. And when you have this intuition that something like this goes into the model where the choice variable is a function of something, how you fix that is you make sure this other thing is going to be an exogenous variable somewhere in the model. And if you do that, then this will end up popping out of the model as part of the solution to the model. So just make sure that when you construct your models, the choice variable is not a function of any variable. Rule number three for economic modeling is that there needs to be forces in your model that pull your choice variable up and also forces that pull your choice variable down. So if there's not forces pulling it both up and down, the solution to your model is either going to be zero or infinity, and both of those are kind of trivial cases. Why do you even need to build a model? So you need to make sure that your model is capturing trade-offs. That's sort of the point of economic thinking, is that we're thinking carefully about the trade-offs that motivate human behavior, and firm behavior and government behavior and all of that. So let me show you a violation of this. All right, here I've set up a model of time spent studying where our objective function is we're maximizing grades minus parental wrath. And we might think this is a cost, parental wrath, because it has a negative sign and it should have a negative sign since it is bad. But when we actually think through the logic here, we realize, okay, I'm going to study more to increase our grades. So this force is pulling time spent studying up. This force, um, we know that studying more is going to decrease parental wrath. So this has a negative relationship. 
So this is actually also going to pull study up. Both of these forces make you want to study more. So the solution to this model is just study 24 seven, which is not reasonable and also not realistic. So that means we have not yet built in a force that pulls us down. And so we need to add a term for opportunity cost or effort cost or something like that in order to make this model actually make sense. All right, and the last rule of modeling is that there needs to be curvature in at least one place in your model. And by curvature, I mean diminishing marginal benefit, increasing marginal cost, or some other graph shape that has curvature. All right, and to see how this works, we're actually gonna need to look at graphs. And a violation of this rule, this fourth rule, is going to be where both graphs are linear. Okay, so if both graphs are linear, um, then how do you optimize grades minus opportunity cost? It's either going to be zero or infinity. And the way I've drawn it here, um, with the grades line, the linear grades graph being steeper than opportunity cost, you can tell that, okay, grades minus opportunity cost is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger forever. So if those are our graphs, the optimal choice for us is infinity. And if I drew it the reverse way where opportunity cost was less steep and grades were more steep, then the optimal choice would be S equals zero. Okay. And just, just to make that clear here, the optimal choice of time spent studying is infinite because the distance between these lines gets bigger and bigger and bigger forever. And let me draw the other case. If these are your graphs, the optimal choice is going to be S equals zero because um, grades minus opportunity cost is really big here and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller till it reaches here and then it's negative everywhere after that. So we don't want a model where the optimal choice is zero or infinite. So the way to fix this is to add curvature to one or the other. So let's fix this. I've added diminishing marginal benefit here and that's going to give us an optimal choice of S that um, biggest distance between our grades function and our opportunity co cost function happens here. But this could also happen if you have um, grades being linear, which doesn't make sense, but just go with me for this, and opportunity cost being curvy. In this case, we also get a solution to the model that's not zero and not infinity. So somewhere in the model, you have to have a graph that's got curvature, which is one of the reasons that economists think a lot about diminishing marginal benefit and increasing marginal cost and curvature and the intuition behind that curvature is because that curvature is what drives our model. So if you're trying to build a model, um, sit down and try to write out your thoughts and then check your model for each of these logical features of economic modeling. And if you find a violation in one, you know you need to fix your model so that it actually holds water and makes sense at the end of the day. So I hope you found this helpful. This really is the foundation of microeconomic theory is modeling. And I think microeconomic theory is taught incorrectly nowadays. I think, I think the best way of teaching microeconomics is to start with the key features of the microeconomic model. So what are the parts of the microeconomic model? What are the logical rules that govern microeconomic models? And then get students building their own models from early in the course. Because that's what makes microeconomics fun and creative and applicable to the real world is the fact that it allows you this logic that you can apply in thinking about any problem you want to. It's, it's incredibly flexible. So in any case, I hope you found this helpful and I hope you sit down and build a microeconomic model of some decision. You can model pretty much any decision in this way and it's a lot of fun once you, once you learn the rules.